it's time for health tips. Now here's your host, Dr. Alma Jenkins. Good evening, thank you so much for watching. I'm Dr. Alma Jenkins and this is Health Tips. We are so happy to be coming into your home on Saturday nights and I appreciate every comment that I've heard so far. You know, the other day I was out and about and someone was telling me they were watching the show and, and so we really appreciate uh, your faithfulness. We hope that you're telling others about the show. And in case you've missed a show or two and you really want to catch up, you may go to DrAlmaJenkins.com and there's a link. You can take that link and uh, watch the show. It is on YouTube now, so we're really happy about that. Um, we've done over 200 shows now uh, and we're very thankful to God for that. So what are we going to talk about tonight? Now we talked last time about the fact that tonight we would talk about ulcer disease. You know, that's so common. Ulcers, either you've had one or you know somebody who's had one or something. But I want to say a word about ulcer disease tonight because there are some things that you can know yourself that might help you get even better care. The more you know, the better off you are in the healthcare environment today. So let's talk a little bit about the common thing called ulcer disease. Okay, so I like to use my little board because sometimes what you see sticks a little bit more than just what you hear. And so if you have the visual and the auditory, hopefully you'll remember it better. So tonight we're going to talk about ulcers. Now there are basically two types of ulcers that we see when we do our endoscopy or look into the stomach. You can either have a gastric ulcer or a duodenal ulcer. And I want you to try to remember these words. If you don't, write it down. Write it down because you know, when you go to the doctor and he tells you you had an ulcer, you can, you can kind of ask, well, was it gastric or duodenal? And that, you know, they'll, they'll stop and look at you. Wow, you know, you know the difference. And why is it even important? Because most duodenal ulcers heal and we, that's the end of it. But there are a few gastric ulcers that might not heal. So most of the time, we will reevaluate you to make sure your gastric ulcer went away, okay? So if you got scoped, maybe your doctor did an endoscopy and you had this big gastric or stomach ulcer, then make sure, and your doctor will make sure, that they've assessed it and no can tell you, no, that's gone now. Because they went back and looked and that ulcer was not there. We don't necessarily do it for du duodenal because, you know, practically all of those seem to go away and heal on their own and, uh, you know, with treatment and even without it, uh, most of these will. But duodenal ulcers tend not to uh, become uh, malignant to the degree that gastrics do. We don't generally go back and look at those unless there's something unusual about them or, you know, there's some reason we want to go back and assess um, that lesion or that ulcer. So let's say a little bit about that. And let me get my little, my little eraser. So you may see another term that refers to both kinds of ulcers, and that is peptic ulcer disease. Peptic ulcer disease refers to either gastric or duodenal ulcers. So you may see that term, okay? So now you're familiar with that. All right, so what causes ulcers anyway? Well, many of you have heard of the bacteria that causes about 80% of ulcers that we see, and it's called H. pylori. H. pylori. And that H stands for Helicobacter. Helicobacter. That bug was discovered, I think, in the 1950s. 
And uh, it, when, it, when we first started, when I first started out in medicine, we knew about this bacteria, but we didn't really, um, you know, people walked around with it, didn't always treat it. Um, very common, and it's still very common. But when we see this now, we do treat it. We're obligated to treat it. You know why? Because although most of the time this does not occur, but occasionally there is a stomach cancer that can originate from this H. pylori. So if you're found to have H. pylori, then you need to be treated for it. So you say, well, how, do I, how can I know if I have it? Well, first of all, not everybody gets tested for it. You know, I wouldn't say because we're, we've had this talk that you need to go and tell your doc that you want to get tested for it necessarily. But if you get scoped and you have ulcers, yeah, you may want to get tested for that. So how do we test for it? Well, there's a blood test. And then there's a stool test. And then there's a breath test. Now, how do you know which one you should get? Well, first of all, your doctor will know. But if, if there's any reason to think that you may have had this H. pylori and gotten treated, or you know that you were treated for it, don't get the blood test. Because the blood test may still be positive, even though the bug is not there, even though the, the H. pylori is gone. Because it just hangs around not the, 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 the uh, bacteria, but the evidence that it was there hangs around. So the blood test is only for people who've never been treated for it. So if you've never been treated for it, you know, then yeah, you can get the blood test because if it's positive, you still need to be treated because you were never treated. But for those of you who may have, or you don't remember if you were or whatever, Go ahead and either get the stool test or the breath test. Now, we do the stool test a lot. One, it's easy. Two, we send it out and they check it and give us the result. The breath test is a good one as well. Not every office has access to getting the breath test done. It's a special thing you have to do. The patient has to drink something and then blow in a bag uh, because the bacteria, it, when it breaks down, gives off a certain substance that's measured and that measurement is is what they use for the breath test so I would say the stool test is probably the simpler one but these two can pick up on active infection so this is how you can pick up on whether or not you have H. pylori okay and you're gonna be hot hot shot when you go to the doctor next time because you know all these facts okay alright so let's say that um, your doctor scopes you. And don't forget what we do when we scope. And you've seen this on the commercials for antacids. All right? You know that, that uh, uh, diagram. This is your esophagus or food pipe. Okay? And of course, this is your stomach. And this is your duodenum or small intestine. And of course, you know you have acid in the stomach. All right, a little pool of acid. Not as much as that, but you do, your stomach has acid. And sometimes the acid can eat through the stomach lining and that can lend to an ulcer. So one of the things, and your stomach has a lining that's pretty tough. It has a tough lining in it, thick, tough lining, okay? Because it's made for that acid, all right? But sometimes it's not that. It could be NSAIDs. Now I want you to be familiar with this term NSAIDs. You know what that stands for? Non-steroidals. Non-steroidals. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And what are those kinds of drugs? Aleve, Motrin, I hope you can see this, Aspirin, 
naproxen, those kinds of drugs, okay? Those are all, and remember that Motrin and Ibuprofen are the same thing, ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who may not know that. So if somebody says, oh, I'm on Motrin, somebody else says, I'm on Ibuprofen, you're on the same thing. Those all are aspirin-type product uh, medicines. And so they have the potential to eat through the lining and cause you to have an ulcer. Some of you wonder, well, what is an ulcer anyway? Because you hear me talking about this, okay? Well, if you take sandpaper, if you could do this, and rub the lining of your stomach till you dig a hole right here, okay? That would be an ulcer. If you took that same sandpaper and rubbed till you just rub some of the top skin off right there, that would be an erosion. Okay? But this is an ulcer, and some people can have big ulcers. Now notice that's kind of a small one, but it's deep. Here's a big one. Look. Look at that. That's a pretty big ulcer. I'm going to outline it here. That's a pretty big ulcer right there. Can you see that? That's a pretty big ulcer right there. So if your doctor tells you, you know, I scoped you today and you had a big ulcer in your stomach, that's important for you to know. They're likely going to check you for H. pylori, as well as treat your ulcer. We do have very effective treatment for ulcers now, okay? But then while they're doing that, they're gonna not want you to take those drugs that I just mentioned if you can help it. Now, some of you have to take aspirin or Plavix or one of those blood thinners, that's the other thing. The blood thinners don't cause the ulcer, but once you get an ulcer, there's a question about whether you can continue to take it. So if you've been diagnosed with an ulcer, it's important to make sure your doctor knows that you're on a blood thinner. What are some of the blood thinners? Well, Coumadin, okay? And there are a lot of new ones out there now, Effient, uh, Xeralto, these are all new drugs that thin the blood, and many of you are on them. That becomes an issue when you've been found to have a big, deep ulcer. So make sure your doctor is aware. They may have to take you off, or we may have to follow you more closely. We may have to put you on extra medication, okay? But at least that will be taken into consideration. And then be aware that you're going to need to be rescoped. Most of the time, this is two to three months later. It takes ulcers about six to eight weeks, we give it. One like this, maybe a little bit longer, but go back and get rescoped to make sure that this heals up. Okay? Because you don't want it to turn into a cancer. All right? And a small percentage of gastric ulcers can do that. So, this is what we're talking about when we say an ulcer. And I've tried to demonstrate for you what one may look like diagrammatically. Okay. So remember, your, your stomach has a thick lining. Um, but sometimes the offender can eat right through that lining. Now, what else could it be if it's not these drugs and if it's not H. pylori? Well, you could be developing a malignancy or a cancer, and those ulcers don't tend to heal. So that's why you recheck for healing when you have a gastric ulcer. Now, the other place you could have it is in here. Look at that. I've drawn a little indentation there. There's an ulcer there. So this is a duodenal ulcer. Those are usually not rescoped for healing. Those usually heal up without a big problem. But keep in mind that any of these ulcers can do what? Bleed. Any of these ulcers can bleed. 
And we've seen people come in vomiting blood from a bleeding ulcer, okay? That can be the case. And if so, we would find out once we put the tube with the light down, scope you and look. We, we can tell if that's what's going on usually. All right? So what should you not do if you have an ulcer? You should not smoke. That retards the healing of the ulcer. So you're offending it. It's like putting salt in a wound, you know. So those of you who do have active ulcers, you've been diagnosed, don't go home and smoke. That makes it worse. That interferes with circulation, okay? So you don't want to smoke if you have an ulcer. What else do you not want to do if you have an ulcer, if you can help it? Well, some of you have been taking, you know, uh, uh, a Motrin or an Aleve before you go to bed. Seems like it just helps you sleep better. You want to stop that. Stop the aspirin drugs. If you can help it. Now, if you're on it for heart reasons or, you know, you've been instructed specifically, check with your doctor to find out when and how you can do that. And sometimes we can't stop them. So we do extra, we try to be extra careful with following you more closely and other medicines we give you to kind of help heal the ulcer maybe a little bit quicker. What do we use to treat ulcers? We use acid reducers. Now many of you have been buying these acid reducers over the counter. And what do we mean by that? What are some of the acid reducers that we've bought over the counter that do help heal ulcers and are quite effective? Prilosec. Prilosec is one of them. And uh, another word for Prilosec, just so you're aware, is omeprazole, the O medicine. Omeprazole. Okay, that's the same thing as Prilosec, so that you know. Other medicines that you'll see over the, uh, is not over the counter now, but that your doctor will give you, Protonics. Nexium. And some others, Asifex. Dexalant. These are just some drugs I'm telling you so you are aware. I hope you can see that very well. But these are drugs that help you to know what you're dealing with um, when your doctor says, you know, writes your prescription. Let me tell you something. I want you to know as much as, as I can possibly get you to know about your, your body and about uh, treating you and about diseases. Because the more you know, the better it is for you. Then you know what questions to ask then you know what things to look for. Well, you say, well, how do I know I have an ulcer? What are some of the symptoms? Okay, let's talk about a few. Of course, one of the very common symptoms is pain. You may have pain in your upper abdomen. And sometimes with an ulcer, it feels better if you eat and then in some people, it feels worse if they eat, so it can vary. But pain is a very real symptom. And then in those ulcers that have started to bleed, you might notice black, tarry, stool. I mean, just look like tar and smells awful. That's classically uh, present with bleeding from the upper intestine, and oftentimes that's an ulcer. Doesn't have to be. There are other things, but that's a very common presentation. So, unless you're taking iron or you've taken some Pepto-Bismol, your stool shouldn't be tarry black. We think tarry black, first thing we think about is blood. 
okay? So, you know, what's interesting <laughs> is a lot of patients will tell me, especially my southern ladies, that they don't look at their stool, you know, some, some of you. Well, you should. You should look at your stool because that's the only way you're going to know if you're bleeding or, you know, if you, you're losing blood to give you a heads up on that. And I can understand when you say you don't look. I mean, it's not something people love to do, but I'm just letting you know that it's something you need to do. Um, and it, it's, it's, it's for your own well-being. Nobody else is going to look at it and know. So when we ask you, have you seen any blood in your stool, you can at least say, well, I didn't see any black tarry stool or fresh blood. And that's how you tell if there's blood in the stool. Now we have a way of testing it to be sure as to whether there's blood in there. But when you come in to see us, we want to know what you've seen. Okay? All right. So those are some of the symptoms of an ulcer. All right, so we've talked about what an ulcer is. We've talked about some of the things that can lead to an ulcer. Okay, and we've talked about treatment, all right? So I hope this helps you, and I hope that if you've been uh, laying around with belly pain these, these last few days, I hope that this will trigger your going in to be seen and to get that taken care of because we don't want something worse to develop. And you say, gee, I wish I had taken care of that when I first started, you know, feeling the pain and especially those who are getting up at night with it. Something very real and serious often will wake you up from your sleep at night, okay? So I hope this is helpful. We have maybe about five minutes left, and so I want to do some exercise in that five minutes because I want you to be a creature of exercise. I want you to know that we value exercise to the point that we try and do some with every show, just to remind you that your body needs it and encourage you to do it. All right? One, two, three, and one, and two. Now you're gonna feel this, three. And I've got three pound weights, so that doesn't sound like much till you put one in each hand, and then you can really feel it. Seven, and eight, nine and ten two three four and you you really will feel that i feel it in my arms already all right so let's do some kind of some stretches that's always good you want to do that first anyway let's just go go to the side like this one two three and smile while you're doing it you know it's a blessing to be able to do this and one two Now let's put our legs up. I hope that you can see me real well here. All right, my legs up like this. One, and you know I talked about this yeah, uh, last uh, week when I said that those of you who are not able to do the arm things but you have pretty good legs, you can try and do the leg exercise. One, two, three, and one. And two, three, and four, five, and six, seven, and eight, nine, and ten, eleven and 12, let's do 15, 13, and 14, and 15, two, three, four, one, and two. I'm doing these uh, lower, lower extremity exercises on purpose because some of you uh, have told me that you don't exercise because, you know, uh, you're not able to walk, uh, distances and this, but I want you to see that you can do some chair things, okay, and be very effective, okay? 
Now let's just bend over here. And I hope you see this very well. You can bend over, hold your ankle, and just stay there for a minute. Just bend over, that's just a stretch. And just see how that feels, just holding your ankles. And now let's go. Oh, and stretch, stretch like you do in the morning. You know, just stretch. Feels good, really. It does. Feels good. Some of you are sitting all day at a computer. Get up from the computer and just kind of move around. You know, if you just stay there all day, it's really not good for you. If those of you who are in front of a computer all day, have certain times that you take breaks, that you get up and rest your eyes and move your shoulders and arms around and your and your, you know, your neck, so that you, you're not getting stiff. Uh, because this is a posture that you're in that, that isn't always the best anyway, and you're there for eight hours. So have your breaks, I'm sure they give you some break time. And then some of those break times, go and drink water, because you just might be dehydrated. Remember what we've said about drinking uh, and keeping hydrated like a plant, because we're mostly water, remember that you're over 70% water in terms of what your body is composed of. So you need it, all right? Whether you like it or not, some people tell me they don't even like water, uh, like drinking water, and that's, I find that very curious. Uh, that's something that you need to keep, uh, uh, keep up on, no matter how busy your job is. Find a way to, to hydrate yourself, all right? So let's go out with exercises, so let's Ah, the dog just came and sat right in front of my feet, didn't I? Didn't she? So let's just do some an arm thing here now. Let's just stretch. Okay, and hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for watching tonight. I'm Dr. Alma Jenkins. Good night.